Rory, great to have you back on. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, so so we spoke pre- almost exactly a year ago, I want to say, and I, I think my first question is just where, where, if anywhere, have you seen opportunities for for alchemy? And for those that don't know what that means, I guess is it fair to describe that as opportunities for rational problem solving? Yeah, um, funnily enough, in the in the last week or so, I've got very interested in this Soviet era innovation approach called TRIZ which stands for something in Russian, it's T-R-I-Z in in English. And it was a guy in the 1950s in the Soviet Union who was, like Einstein, I suppose, working as a patent clerk, although I'm not quite sure why they had patents in the Soviet Union, but never mind. Um, And started, he ended up getting rewarded with five years in a labor camp for some reason, but he started looking at common patterns of innovation. And it occurred to me that what we're actually practicing, he was he was mostly looking in the field of engineering. And there are these common little patterns where your problem, which he always describes as being a contradiction, most problems arise from a contradiction. So a very simple thing would be, you want an umbrella to be very big to protect you from the rain, but if an umbrella is too big, then when it gets caught by the wind, you basically get wrenched off your feet. Okay. Now, the solution to that in that case is, I don't know if you've ever had a gust-proof umbrella, but it's effectively two canopies which where the inner one overlaps the outer one so that air can actually escape, uh, albeit against the direction of travel, in the event that you get caught in the wind. I mean, it does mean your umbrella makes a loud farting noise, but on the other hand, that's probably better than losing the thing altogether. Flying and away, yeah. <laughs> that's that's an example. So he always looks at what you might call contradictions and then looks at lo- uh, various methodologies that are used to resolve them. So funnily enough, a perfect one uh, that is an example which could be deployed to, say, video conferencing or indeed online retail is you make the thing that's static move and you make the thing that traditionally moves stay still. It's just a reframing of the thing. Now, if you think about online retail, traditionally, you know, essentially it was the people who moved around and the, uh, you know, and the goods that stayed still in the shop. And you could you could look at online retail as just a reversal of that. And they're about, I mean, if you look at these various TRIZ practitioners, there are lots of them. And it occurs to me that what we really practice is the psychological version of TRIZ, which is sometimes you can resolve a contradiction psychologically, Right, you know, people don't like waiting for taxis, but we only have 10 taxis. Well, the way to resolve that psychologically is to say, if they know the taxi's on the way and they can watch it approach, the wait becomes a lot less painless. Painful, sorry. The wait becomes a lot less painful. And, you know, there's a beautiful example of psychological triz, which is the res- the creative resolution of an inherent, a seemingly inherent contradiction, um, which I've just bought today, actually, which is an example of alchemy, because it turns a weakness into, stre- into a strength. It turns lead into gold by essentially telling a new story about it, reframing it, repositioning it, changing the consumer's context, um, Uh, of perception and therefore changing the meaning of the product, even if the product itself hasn't materially changed. And it's a beautiful case where it's premium eggs from rare egg manufacturers. Okay, now the thing about eggs produced by rare breeds of hen, which I think for reasons of biodiversity we should try to support, is they tend to be different colors. And if you put them in a square egg box, they look crap. OK, because, you know, you have an egg box, which is like brown, 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 blue, blue, white, brown, white, blue, blue, looks rubbish. OK, the way they've resolved this beautifully is they put six eggs in a ring where the different colors now look like a decorative feature rather than the failing. And it's just an example of how by representing something differently, you can turn a weakness into a strength. Yeah. And and. You know, I mean, I mean the classic lager slogan in the UK, which was for Stella Artois, reassuringly expensive, is a brilliant example. You know, we want to sell a lot of lager, but our lager costs money to make, or we want a large amount of profit. Actually, the solution to that is essentially make a virtue out of the expensiveness. Yeah. And that way, by the way, I think people who are only having one or two lagers are probably heavily disposed to go, well, let's make this one count. 
Right. And they have the glass and they have all the, the yeah, all that other, all, but yeah. I mean, I've also been fascinated recently. There's a British guy called James Hoffman. I don't know if you know him on YouTube, but he's he was the world champion barista about 13 years ago. And he makes these insanely detailed um, videos on how to make pour over V60 coffee, uh, you yeah. know, how, how, to, how to use a mocha pot, you know, right down to the level of scales, and weighing water and God knows what else. Well, I thought it was so funny what you said about the umbrella because I've, I've g- complained about that to my girlfriend for forever about like, the, yeah. you know, this was invented, whatever, X hundred years ago. And it hasn't innovated at all. So I didn't even know about that. So that's pretty, that's, that's exciting. No, no, the gust proof <laughs> umbrella is a very, very simple invention. It really yeah. essentially has these two overlapping canopies so that there's an air escape vent, which doesn't interfere with its ability to protect you from the rain, but does prevent it becoming a wind trap, like a sort of, you know, wind anchor effectively. Right, right. And so that, you know, that's a beautiful solution. And what Triz sought to do was to kind of do the Linnaean job of classifying these solutions. Um, and, you know, some of them are really interesting because I think the, the methodology we tend to use in problem solving is one of optimization. But optimization of one or two dimensions doesn't necessarily resolve contradiction. And quite often you resolve contradiction, you know, make the thing that's static move, make the thing that moves static is one example. But another thing is go to two extremes rather than one average is, uh, you know, now that would also be a psychological um, uh, solution space. You know, in other words, don't produce a mid-priced vacuum cleaner, either produce an insanely cheap vacuum cleaner by changing the rules, or in the case of Dyson, produce an insanely expensive one. Yeah. Um, and so so I think I, I've been very, and it makes perfect sense, actually. At first, you go, why are you looking to the Soviet Union for inspiration? Uh, you know, for problem solving. But then I looked at it and thought, well, actually, the Soviet Union was like an uber bureaucracy. It was like being in a modern, large multinational, only times 10, okay? So actually, the people who spotted the problem first, that actually institutions aren't very well geared up for you know, what you might call the the resolution of apparent contradictions. They tend to pursue one target at the exclusion of others. Well, I remember either reading or hearing something and they were talking about kind of like skin in the game and branding as it refers. And maybe this, I apologize if this was Could have been me. Yeah, Yeah, it could have been you. And it was, was it, did you talk about the idea of there wasn't any brand on like shipping parts or mechanical yeah, yeah, that might yeah, be okay, me. Yeah. So the Soviet <laughs> Marxism generally found brands ideologically unsatisfying uh, for various reasons. So you would actually literally go into a shop which said bread shop, or it might, you know, under Maoist China, it would say bread shop of the people number 107964 or whatever. Okay. And on the shelves, it would just say bread. Okay. And it might have a few choices of bread. It certainly wouldn't have had sourdough or, you know, focaccia or whatever. But the problem there is, of course, branding to some extent is the unit of selection. It's the equivalent of the gene in evolution, in that it's the unit of selection. And if consumers can't reward brands they like and punish brands they don't like, you've lost that fundamental part of feedback in determining whether you're, what you're producing is ultimately creating value or whether it isn't. And so the, the value of bread is determined by some bureaucrat in the Ministry of Food who decides that you can call your thing bread if it contains a certain percentage of ingredients. Now, of course, taste probably gets left out of that equation, by the way. Um, you know, it's simply, and so the Soviet Union had this fantastic problem with metrics in that most famously, um, uh, there was, I think it's apocryphal, the story that there was a nail factory, which was rewarded on the weights of nails they produced. So it ended up spending one month producing a nail that weighed about a ton and a half or something. I think yeah. that's apocryphal. It was true that they had this major spate of chandelier collapses in the Soviet Union yeah. because the lamp factories were rewarded by weight of output and so had no incentive to make anything other than insanely heavy lights. And so quite often the ceilings wouldn't support them. Right. Yep. And so it is, it is worth noting that without branding, um, essentially innovation and experimentation can't work. 
And there is no way of accurately determining what it is that people want versus what it is that people don't, other yeah. than farming it out to a third party who doesn't understand, except in the crudest, most kind of banausic terms, what it is that people want from bread. Now, under yeah. conditions of starvation, yeah, that's probably true that bread is valued on its calorific value. Okay. Yeah. And I guess like, where do you see that playing out now? Like I almost feel like Amazon's had to take that lesson, for example, because they, they would have, you know, we're just going to own everything and put our own label on it and make yeah. it cheaper. But now it seems like they're just building up brands and making it so the brands can exist and so on. So I'm I, just wondering where you're seeing I think that the Amazon marketplace um, is a little bit of a added value disaster area in the sense that even if I search for Samsung television which is that I've decided elsewhere outside the website that I want a Samsung television. The first three televisions it will bring up will be televisions of equivalent size from manufacturers I've never heard of. Now, what you're there doing is something that no retailer would do, which is destroying your ability to make a premium sale it's worth noting that, of course, one of the peculiarities of Amazon is it's not really judged on its profits or its margins. It's judged on the volume of sales. And so Amazon doesn't really have an incentive to up the margin. The only danger of that in some categories is I end up buying nothing because suddenly my Samsung television seems quite expensive compared to these other televisions. Yeah, and you get this paradox no of choice risking, mess. Yeah. I'm not risking $500 on a Wu-Angui television. No way, right? So I end up not buying a television at all or going to John Lewis to buy a television where the retailer choice architecture actually makes some sense. You know, I mean, there is a fundamental problem with online retail in that what shops do, which is you put some products on a pedestal and you de-emphasize others to make choice somehow easier in many ways, because people, you know, infer all sorts of things. OK, so this is the top of the range micro microwave. I don't really need this. Yeah. But on the other hand, OK, and by putting everything in a bloody grid, in this egalitarian grid, you've kind of Sovietized retail in a way. Right, um, right. And I think, so I think, you know, I think that large, I think that the tech industry and the consulting industry are in some ways conniving with the business world, um, with managerial and bureaucratic uh, elements within the business world to make capitalism increasingly Soviet. Yeah, that's, in that it's that's obsessed, It's obsessed with what you can actually quantify and commoditize and therefore completely neglects the creation of other forms of less quantifiable value. Right. Um, and there's there's so many places to go there. One thing with the Amazon, it reminded me of just how Google does this too, where they'll allow competitors to outbid each other, even if you're specifically searching for a particular thing. And I've just never understood how that helps them or, in, or anyone else. You know, so it's- No, I, I, I mean, yeah. a classic example with Amazon, I may have told you last a year ago, which is I was looking for a toaster. I was looking at dual lit toasters. I was looking at other toasters. And on page about six of Amazon, because I persevered, I discovered there was such a thing as a glass-sided toaster. Yeah. Now, if you only ever toast the same kind of bread, a glass-sided toaster isn't very valuable. You learn the setting and off you go. But I mean, one thing Britain's quite good at is kind of what we what are technical morning goods. I mean, scones, muffins, crumpets, you know, pikelets. Scotland's particularly good at these things, by the way. But the bakery culture in Scotland's fantastic. And all these things require a different level of toasting. So a glass-sided toaster is actually a bit of a godsend. And the crazy thing is, you know, if you were a retailer, you'd put this on prominent display. So anybody like me who is willing to divvy up the extra 40 or 50 pounds to have a glass sided toaster wouldn't miss it. OK, but I don't know what the, algor uh, the algorithm is doing in Amazon, but it's chucking me a load of toasters so cheap I wouldn't trust them not to catch fire. Yeah. But with that, like, can you tell me what... Essentially, do you are you are you bullish or bearish on this idea of data? Like, I feel like X years ago, you know, it was going to be the thing that that changed our whole lives, and now it seems like it was that was overvalued. You know, it seems like the algorithm actually can't do as much as we thought it yeah, did. But I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on I, that. I, I, I mean, two things about this. I'm you know, I mean, information is of value. Okay, so to suggest that data, or in and of itself, is bad, is uh, probably wrong. OK, on the other hand, one, how you present it, OK, has an enormous effect on how people respond to it. So the idea that we are objective perceivers of data uh, simply isn't true. 
So um, you can present the same thing. I'll give you an example of this, okay. Um, nearly all data contains missing components, okay. You achieve a certain amount of chart clarity, graph clarity, or table clarity through ignoring certain things in order to compress the data to a form which is kind of tractable and comprehensible, okay. And in the process, you lose things out, which are just difficult to measure. Now, if you want a great book on this, by the way, and I recommend it to all your listeners, uh, a book by an anarchist anthropologist called James C. Scott called Seeing Like a State. Um, that the states need to comprehend what it governs, forces it into some very, very unusual kind of statistical compromises, which right. causes the statist view of the world to be very incomplete and very unrepresentative of everyday lived experience. I mean, a fantastic example of this a thousand years old, when William I conquered England and produced the Doomsday Book, which is a kind of catalogue from about 1080, I think, of, you know, it's, it's a great, it's a bit of a badge of honour if you're an English village and you're mentioned in the Doomsday Book because it suggests you're really, really old. It doesn't mention people at all. It mentions cattle and it mentions land and various other things and, yeah, trees and buildings, and, yep. but it doesn't mention people. Um, and and Scott talks a lot about 18th century Prussian forestry, where you talked about, you know, the right. weight of timber per acre. But what you ignored was, first of all, the condition of the land, because depending on the condition of the land, you may want to grow more or fewer trees. Uh, and it's not really an accurate comparison. But secondly, it completely ignores the value of things like undergrowth, brushwood, scrub wood, which have a value in both present preventing forest fires, apparently, don't ask me how, right. uh, but also in, in maintaining the soil quality. It doesn't include wildlife. It doesn't include, you know, um, the need to have a few bears kicking around to keep the the sapling eating herbivores at a manageable level. Right. The, the wider ecosystem gets ignored. So there's that problem. There's also the problem of data being used not to um, uh, not not to inform decisions, but to support them. Okay, so that's cherry picking of data for support rather than illumination. Uh, there's also the issue of data being used to make decisions in the absence of any human intervention which I have a problem with. Um, just to give a very simple example, you, you go, that, that's remote AI. No, it isn't. A speed camera does that. And I'm not entirely comfortable with a speed camera because, don't get me wrong, okay, four out of five times I've been done by a speed camera. I deserved it. I was breaking the law. I was wrong. One time I did it, I did it to avoid a dangerous driver, okay? There was a guy who was either having a massive row with his wife or was pissed or both and was basically swerving all over the road. So the only thing I could do, he wasn't driving very fast, but he was weaving from lane to lane, something which, by the way, the speed camera obviously doesn't detect. It only detects speed, doesn't detect pissedness, okay? Right. And so what I did is I just went out to the fast lane, waited for him to drift over to the left and reach a point of you know, where the argument with his wife had slightly quietened down. And I basically just welled it for 300 yards to get past him and then got flashed in the process because it was an unfamiliar stretch of road. Now, that's uh, all I'm saying is no human policeman would have been arresting me under those circumstances. He would have been arresting the other guy. And so that's an example of kind of making decisions without the full picture. And then, of course, there are wonderful things. I, Nassim's work, I don't know if you're a fan of Nassim Taleb, but his work on IQ, which suggests that the correlation between um, life outcomes and IQ does exist, okay, at a mathematical level, but it's nearly all at the left-hand side. It's not at the right-hand side. Mm. It's extraordinarily important. Because, yes, okay, the reason there's a correlation, I, I, and by the way, I'm, I'm weirdly, uh, and, and for a very, very strange reason, I've got a great aunt, and she may even be a slightly more distant relative than that, who was a kind of anthropologist, Apologist and also involved, I think, in those early days of kind of, you know, phrenology and brain size capacity measurement. She ended up actually, weirdly, at Princeton for a time, working with the guy who devised the SAT test for the United States. Okay. Yeah. And she was always a little bit uncomfortable with IQ testing because she said, you know, it's, there are a load of things it's not factoring in. It's not factoring in educational disadvantage. Uh, it's not factoring in cultural factors. I'm fairly sure one of the things she found, okay, was that Native Americans and 
I think African Americans, were better at memorizing poetry than white folks. Okay. Now, interestingly, that never made it into the IQ test, did it? Because the measure of perfect IQ was probably a white academic. At right. that stage. And the academics doing IQ testing and selecting for measurement would have been disproportionately inclined to measure the kind of things at which academics did well and discount those things at which their favoured class of people would do worse. But Nassim's other point is that actually wealth to IQ correlation pretty much breaks down completely. Once you get above 95, most of the correlation is created by the fact that, unsurprisingly, when you get an IQ below 75, you're unlikely to be in high paid employment. Yeah, okay? you just need kind of a base level to get lift off. And, and actually, sense. actually, there's another guy I've spoken to who says there's there are two other little inflection points that if you kind of want to be a doctor, you want about 115, 120. Um, yeah. Although it's, it's not as high as you'd think, actually. Um, and then if you want to be if you want to be in high energy physics, you although having said that, I mean, uh, Richard Feynman always claimed that he'd been IQ tested and had an IQ of 122. Yeah. And his book is fantastic because he basically shows, you know, all the areas where the wrong things are measured. And he, I remember the story where he goes off to Brazil and he finds out that the whole physics department was essentially just writ large memorizing things and didn't actually understand anything. Didn't understand anything. Amazing. No, no, no. Uh, there's a lovely story of Feynman's, which I absolutely love, which is he was shown the plans for some extraordinary heavy water plant or something. Yeah. And he didn't understand the plans at all. And he said there were these various things which might have been taps or valves, but for all I knew, they could have been windows. Okay. Right. And he said, by complete fluke, I pointed at one of them and said, what happens if you close that just to try and look intelligent? And the guy who was behind this, looked and looked again and looked again and then about 30 seconds later said oh shit basically meaning there will be a total catastrophic meltdown in the plant you see yeah. and from then on he viewed Feynman as a complete genius even though Feynman said I genuinely question. hadn't got a clue what this thing meant yeah um, so just to kind of take things back to something you said earlier which was yeah. you know uh the idea of consultancies agencies conspiring with business to sovietize uh the 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 business world. I guess that doesn't it doesn't come as a huge surprise because well, if, if you read about Carnegie of the and Soviet stuff, Soviet delusion. Yeah. If you if you look at people like the Chileans had that extraordinary attempt, didn't they, to build CyberSyn? Right. Which was it was under Allende, I think, which was a kind of computer controlled economy, which mimicked the efficiency of free markets while centralizing decision making. Right. And the whole question really resides in to what extent decision making needs to be centralized. And my generalization to that answer is sometimes quite a lot, but generally as little as possible. I mean, there have been, let's be candid about this, there have been advantages to the, the National Health Service in the UK during COVID. And one of them was the ability to perform uh, treatment, randomized control trials around treatment at scale very quickly. Right. So, you know, that, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not moronic here. I'm not one of those sort of weird, you know, uh, but it's fair to say that it's very, very difficult to find data at the center which accurately captures the nuance of what's going on at the, at the coalface. Yeah. And, and I guess with that, are, are there any are there any like forehead slapping kind of opportunities for alchemy in the context of COVID where you've just said, why why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we presenting this as a, in a better way to get people to uh, adopt the right behavior? One of them, which nobody tried. Uh, one, one thing, I, the only thing I really got right a bit early was I thought ventilation was something worth exploring. And that was actually because of some someone I spoke to in a conference call in India who'd mentioned that actually in the tw in the 1918 flu epidemic they treated people in outdoor hospitals very successfully. And I wondered about ventilation uh, earlier than most people did, but it wasn't my, uh, you know, it, it wasn't uh, uh, specifically my own insight. But it was. I think that was worth questioning a bit earlier. I've also wondered whether they should have tested variolation which is on a small scale, the deliberate infection of people with a small initial dose, not in the lungs. So now apparently um, the technique you would have used, because I did ask experts about this, was anal insufflation, which is the medical term for blowing it up your ass. <laughs> um, the other consideration was very, very small, what they used to do with smallpox, very small subcutaneous. Now my argument for that was an evolutionary one, which is that our 
Exposure to airborne viruses is comparatively recent because urbanization is a comparatively recent phenomenon in human history. Whereas our exposure to viruses and infection under the skin, we've got a million years of experience of scratches, bites, you know, all manner of forms of, you know, gangrenous wounds, etc. So that the skin immune system is likely to be a bit better than the lung immune system. Now, I don't know enough about this. To, you know, by the way, I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting anybody does this. I mm -hmm. merely said that it struck me as strange, given the scale of the problem, that nobody was trying this at some level to see whether it might work. Because it worked for several hundred years for smallpox, in right. that you know the royal family, thanks to a woman called Elizabeth Mary Wirt, sorry, Mary Wortley Montague, she was called, I think, um, who persuaded the royal family to variolate their children, having come back from Turkey, where the practice had been established. You basically got uh, the smallpox, I think it's the minor version of smallpox, in a very weak form and effectively infected people in their elbow, the idea being not to leave a visible scar, I think. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and it did strike me as a bit weird that nobody was at least looking at this as a short-term fix in areas of very high uh, high. Um, uh, infection it struck me as a bit weird that nobody even tried it maybe they did i mean you know maybe some dodgy regime tried it on their prisoner population or on their soldiery i don't know right. um and one thing that does strike me as possible is two well two things that interest me one it's highly possible that something relatively mild and in common use might be found to have a very significant effect simply because it's an it's it, it's of course uh the neo part OK, because this is a new virus, you know, that science fiction trope where the world gets taken over by aliens and then it suddenly turns out that they're killed by salt water. You know that? Right. Thing, or, right? or, or, or microbes in the air or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or some, yeah. yeah some, something that we're immune to basically right. proves fatal to them. It strikes me as not unlikely that something like that may subsequently be found. We haven't found it yet, but that something actually surprisingly banal, like spraying something in the air might have an extraordinary effect. Um, this is why I thought I thought people were a bit harsh about Trump, by the way, because he was burbling on yep. about bleach. He didn't mean bleach. I mean, he wasn't very precise. There is this very, very pure thing, which actually the body produces, which is called, oh, crikey. There's a particular version of a kind of bleach, right. which may have fairly good antiviral properties. I mean, he was you, you, it's a spray, I think, of some kind. Um, yeah, but, well, and but of, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't rule out that kind of. The other thing I think, uh, absolutely clearly, is if you look at India now, if you look at the UK, Spain, Germany, um, it's completely defied our ability to make comfortable generalizations about transmission. Right. Right. And there is something about transmission. There is a. It's like a three-body problem or a four-body problem where we only know about two of the bodies. Okay? Right. And I think. There's something there, you know, I mean, God knows what it might be. That First of all, I think the spread is probably very lumpy. And if we only knew what created super spreader incidents, we'd be a lot, you know, we'd be a lot wiser, but we don't. Yeah, and, you know, it, there may be a particular combination of genetics, circumstance, um, age, um, initial size of dose or locus of infection. OK, because if you think about it, there are a lot of variables at play here, right? Right. And, and that, period from period from first infection. OK, if you look at the number of variables at play, trying to make sense of them, the multidimensionality problem. Um, and, it, and, and AI hasn't done it yet, has it? Machine learning. It hasn't. But I, I guess there's there's so many dimensions to this and there's there's so much complexity that it's felt like this forcing function. And then you get people like Tyler Cohen, you know, saying this is the end of the great stagnation. The idea of all the, the technological ceiling that we hit is now being broken through. So I guess I just I'd love to hear your thoughts oh, on that. Tell, tell me that, about, yeah, yeah. One thing I do agree. I read this paper uh, by Noah Smith. Mm -hmm in no opinion, on what he calls distributed service sector productivity. And I do believe that video conferencing, okay, uh, which is something we've talked about a lot, but something we've talked about less, which is actually the fact that actually an extra 100 million people have become sort of video broadcasters. 
you know, I'm not talking about TikTok here. I'm talking about the fact that medical conferences will now be streamed online as a matter of course. The yeah. fact that I can go online and uh, during the COVID, I was, one evening I attended a, a, a talk at Duke University, all credit to them, it was an excellent talk. It was free on insect epidemiology and how insects behave to cope with infection, which, by the way, is a kind of variolation. But I'll park that. I'm not, I'm not a single issue fanatic here. OK, um, you know. Um, uh, so so the, the, the other thing, of course, that makes it a bit more complicated is that human behaviour is always a factor, OK? And human behaviour is not so easy to model. So I'll give you an example of this. Even if you could be fairly confident that outdoor transmission is relatively rare, OK? And so the science tells you that there are few cases transmitted outside. You've got to be a bit careful because outdoor socialising tends to lead to indoor socialising. And that happened at the White House, didn't it? They had an event in the Rose Garden and then it got a bit nippy or people all went inside to that kind of orangery thing you've got, you know, right? right? Um, and so, you know, if you allow people to socialise in their gardens in a perfect world where people behave with ant-like conformity, they'd all stay outside, they'd say goodbye and they go home. What actually happens is it gets a bit cold, the patio heater runs out of gas, people move into the conservatory and leave the door open, then they close the door, then three people leave, use the loo, and the next thing you know is you've got an argument about Brexit in the kitchen. You know, so there, you know, you can use the science up to a point, but they're always knock-on effects in terms of how people respond to the information. Yeah, and and I think that that's that's really important. And one thing that just kind of get back to this COVID as a forcing function kind of thing. It seems like there's so much that's come out of it. We might have a malaria vaccine, gene folding, and all this other stuff that's way above my head. But I, I guess I guess do you have any thoughts on? Could you kind of manufacture that same sort of behavior where you can be deliberate about creating a situation where you can have lots of happy accidents? Like if we just put more energy towards this this thing or investigating this particular problem it, even if we don't solve it it's likely to lead to all sorts of other solutions if you, i'd love to hear yeah, what you I think mean, about i think that. i think one of the things we could do more of is um uh, put it this way i think ultimately we've probably reached a point of human development okay where there are more good ideas you can post rationalize than there are good ideas you can pre rationalize and so the requirement in business in science etc only to test the things that you can explain in advance is actually a constraint on progress. I mean, to be honest, okay, the reason I came to this, my brother's a scientist. I'm, I'm from a family of, you know, fairly scientific family, actually, with doctors and various people kicking around, okay? But I spent 25 years in a creative department of an advertising agency. And generally, that strange thing that creative people often say, that you don't actually have ideas, they're floating around in the air and you manage to catch them. And then you develop a kind of smell where you go, well, that's interesting. And then you try and explain. It's a bit like biology rather than physics, OK? Biology is a science of exceptions. What Darwin did is he thought, why do all these finches have different shaped beaks, even though they're living on islands only a small distance apart, OK? And you notice things, and you notice exceptions and oddities and anomalies and counterintuitive things. And then you see what use you can make of them. Now, it, if you like, that's the sort of process. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll go back to Feynman here. There's this fantastic bit of film on YouTube. I mean, geez, I watch it about once every two weeks just to, for the laugh, where Feynman basically goes, this is how the scientific process works. I'm not doing him justice. Yeah. He, his final wife was, a, a, Brit, was yeah. a Brit, I'm <laughs> delighted to say, by the way. Um, uh, probably because only British women have low enough standards of expectations of male behaviour to put up with Richard Feynman. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, but but the but the fantastic thing was he said this is this is how the scientific process works. First of all, you guess, okay, and of course everybody in the lecture hall bursts out laughing, and he says, "Don't laugh. That's exactly how it works. You start off with a guess." And then if your guess doesn't live up to experiment or it doesn't fit with reality, then your guess is wrong. And, of course, if you're in this world where everything, you know, you look at mRNA vaccines, right, where the poor lady who's Hungarian, I think, uh, you know, ended up being demoted at Penn. And, yeah, it's a shit-hot university, right? And here she was, you know, at one point she thought of just quitting her career and so on. and. The, the role of effectively um, 
having some sort of random science or just curious science or humorous science or mischievous science. Andre Gein, who's the great guy who came up with graphene, you know, he he refer, he says, you know, I can do the kind of science where, you know, you put in loads of grant applications and you wait for ages. That He goes, but basically I find that boring. He said, what I like practicing is kind of hit and run, drive-by science, hit and run shootings. He's the guy who levitated a frog. You know, a lot of his stuff's crazy, right? Niels Bohr, I mean, David Ogilvy was always a huge fan of Niels Bohr because the scientists in the laboratory were always playing practical jokes on each other. Now, there is scope somewhere out there for what I call, you know, science that works backwards. In other words, you have a, you know, a random idea or a punt, and then you only post-rationalise it in retrospect. You don't try and rationalise it in advance. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's so what's so cool about Ogilvy and the, the you bringing that up is that there's there's so much you know abstraction and so much creativity, but it's all grounded in the idea that he could experiment. Like so much of Ogilvy on advertising is about direct mail and actually being able to test the ideas and that that's, sort of thing. That's my I, all credit to the direct mail and the um, direct marketing industry. By the way, we were doing randomized control trials about seventy or eighty years before the medical fraternity were. Yeah. So it was partly an anomaly with printing presses, which is that newspaper printing presses usually printed newspapers in parallel. Uh, you typically have two or four. and That's either an A-B test or an A-B-C-D test. And then maybe at the request of the direct marketing industry, and I've never known whether this is or whether it's just a production norm, they interleave them. OK, so when you produce newspapers on a printing press, they came out of two parallel presses. So you could vary the ad copy from one to the other. And then effectively it was A, B, 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 and it went out then to be packed and distributed. So that two people buying consecutive newspapers in the same shop would get a different ad. Yeah. It, obviously the, the effect wouldn't work if you basically didn't do that interleaving process or wouldn't work right. as well. It probably would work a bit, but you could always worry that, oh no, it's just a geographical artifact that, you know, these newspapers all went to the rich part of town or whatever, that would mess up your finding. Yeah. And so all credit to the old direct marketing boys, they were doing this, you know, admittedly there were fewer ethical questions uh, involved. Uh, there is an ethical question, by the way, which is newspapers historically, now they're more desperate, I'm not sure this is true, but historically newspapers would never allow you to test price that way. They said you can test a creative approach that way and you can test a proposition or you can test a, um, uh, you know, you can test a different coupon design or anything like that. That's fine. But we don't think it's fair for our readers to be quoted a separate price for the same product. So that was always off limits um, uh, in direct yeah. marketing because of newspaper editor or newspaper owners belief in the ethics of, of the whole thing. Well, kind of tied to that, it seems like recently, you know, I've had conversations with agencies that are going back to print that are doing more direct mail. Some of this is inspired by yeah. the uh, the Apple Facebook beef and that there's less tracking and that sort of thing. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Do you think that's just an aberration, just like a blip on the radar? Or do you think we're heading towards back I, to something? I recently, without giving anything away, I think, I recently recommended to a giant Silicon Valley firm, one of the big five, that they sell a product through direct mail. And the point I made is, look, first of all, it's much rarer than it used to be, where no one's bombarded with the stuff anymore. Uh, if you got an email, if you got a, a physical letter from Facebook or Google without or micro, you know, Microsoft, it says, it communicates certain things, one, about the specialness of the recipient, but B, about the importance of the product that, uh, in question, that wouldn't be communicated by an email or by programmatic marketing or by anything else. One of those things being costly signaling, but that's not the only one, okay? Um, uh, can, you know, uh, if you were opening a club, direct mail would be a much, if you think about it, okay, if you're opening a reasonably exclusive, are you in New York, by the way? I, I keep forgetting where you are. Normally I am, I'm in Austin for the next few months with all the cool lovely, kids. Lovely, yeah. lovely place. I've been there, I loved it. Absolutely yeah. loved it. I, I, yeah. I remember a, a very happy afternoon spent in the LBJ Presidential Library, among other things. And you still need to go. I think it was closed for a little while. So Yeah, I no, but out. understandably, yeah. 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 Fantastic, be beautiful, beautiful place. And I need to read the book too while I'm here. I think it's going to be a good place to get through, to start Perfect. cracking those Caro books. It'll take a while. <laughs> I also think Austin's one of those places which actually secretly 
um, all Americans really quite like, which is kind of a yeah. liberal enclave surrounded with a bit of pickup truck country, which, to be honest, gives you the best of America, doesn't it? Because it, it, it does. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a fun place, and it's it's the secrets out. Like it's becoming very huge, and you know everyone's flocking here. But I think my understanding is the demographics of Texas are changing, you know, for yeah. better or worse because of that. Where's California tax exile? Even when I was here eight years yeah. ago. Yeah. But um, tax exiles. That, well, the thing about that's weird about Texas is you, you you save money if you're not if you don't own property. If you own property, they actually tax you more within other places, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Ah, interesting. And it's on the value of the property, is it not? Not the acreage or the. That's my understanding. Yeah, <laughs> is, is the is the property values. Yeah, property tax is higher here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How far I'm, are you? Sorry to distract your poor listeners. How far no, are you from those fine. Texas Highlands? How much of a drive is that? Like the hill country and that sort yeah. of thing. That that's right outside, basically. Yeah, because um, it's spectacularly hour. beautiful. I mean, well, yeah. I, 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 you know, uh, as a Brit, you know, we got quite good countryside, and I think we, you know, we got quite high standards of rurality. But I have to say, I looked at the Texas Hill Country and thought, shit, that looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 gorgeous, and it's uh, I haven't I haven't really delved into it too much. We're here for a few months, basically. Like my girlfriend and I, we just got sick of being in New York for so long. <laughs> yeah. We just wanted to test test, also, test drive. It, also, so. hit New Mexico and yeah. the best ventilated opera house in the world, the Santa Fe Opera. Oh, fantastic! Uh, is, uh, it, it's actually open to the desert. New Mexico is utterly magical and fabulous. I mean, yeah, I need, I need to go. I've been years ago, so I got to check yeah, that out. No, no. Um, hit it again; it's wonderful. I'd love to, yeah. To kind of bring bring this down sorry, down to sorry, earth for, I, for our audience. No, no, I, I, podcast. I'm sorry about that. No, I don't care. No, I'd love to talk more about Texas. Um, yeah. it, it's probably too much barbecue here too. So that's that's another occupational hazard being down here. But um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on just kind of what how things have changed in, in terms of how you're seeing companies buy marketing services. Like what, I don't know if you're involved in pitches anymore or how often you're dealing with that, but what's, how are things progressing? And, you know, what are the things that frustrate you most? <laughs> well, the whole thing's a ghastly mess because the way agencies are paid, yeah, we, we lost commission, which um, was heavily imperfect as a way of paying agencies. And David Ogilvy was a long-term opponent of the commission system. The problem was we replaced it with something which just brought us a new set of problems, not least being that the way you create value and the way you make money are very poorly aligned. And I think one of the things that's uh, happened with commission, by the way, and which I think is true of every single ad agency on the planet, so I'm not really talking out of school when I say this, is that every single goddamn agency has a creative department that's too small and a finance and account handling department that's too big. Um, That if you look at how agencies ultimately create value for clients, the creative process of adding value may be more uneven than the um, client service mode, okay? It may be less predictable, but nonetheless, most of the mega value ultimately will come from some planning insight or creative idea or something of that kind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the extent, if you look at the ratios of all agencies, I, I'm, as I said, I'm not really telling tales out of school because Mark Reed has said the same thing in public, okay? But the ratio, and it's partly a product of how we're paid. It's partly a product, I would argue, of the fact that if you're being a bit of an amateur anthropologist, okay, creative departments and planning departments have a prestige hierarchy, whereas client service still has a dominance hierarchy. I mean, some of it exists to actually mirror the convoluted approval processes and hierarchies of the client organization. But it's also true that client service people, for some bizarre reason, absolutely love having direct reports. And so when money is made available to them in their chimp-like way, by which I mean the prestige, the the dominance hierarchy, okay, the silverback account man, Mm. okay, the... um, when money is made available to them, they would much rather spend that money on people who report directly to them than on parts of the agency which can actually, um, uh, you know, go their own way and operate according to different rules. Yeah. And so I think that is also a factor in distorting the shape. Of, so I think we should talk about this a lot because genuinely, probably the most value you could create from an ad agency is by having a creative department with not quite enough to do. Okay. Right. Uh, Now I don't mean, just to be clear, this is a very delicate balance, right? 
Do you think that exists writ large, though, in every like in, in every department? If you just have less to do, then maybe yes. Be I mean, little, yeah. un- undoubtedly, we've optimized efficiency without optimizing effectiveness, and they're not. You know, yeah. you know, there's always a point at which. Don't get me wrong, right? I mean, I think there was a huge amount of fat in the ad industry um, uh, going back. But there's another dumb thing which I'm going to talk about. You know, I, I don't think some of the some of the, the the fat shifting was a bad thing. I had a great colleague actually, Mike Sim, who's now a vicar, but he was my art director for many years, and he said there was one agency he worked in which he said got it just right. By which I mean what you might call the Taylorist versus fun balance was just right. In other words, it wasn't, oh, my God, there's someone here who's unbillable for three hours. This is a catastrophe. Nor was it the kind of place where people floated off on Friday afternoon and didn't come back. You know, there's a kind of balance between those things. And it's not necessarily easy to hit. Yeah. The other great failing which annoys me, and this this also goes back to my direct marketing heritage. Um, I'm still a direct marketer. I, I, you know, I'm a practitioner in the behavioral sciences. But basically, that's a fancy term for direct marketer. That's still what I am. OK, I've never changed my I, I started in 1988 in direct marketing. I was a pupil of the great Drayton Bird, who was kind of like the British Claude Hopkins. If you know, and that's, you know, uh, the, the British, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, guru in the field. And that's that's what I still am. I mean, I, I, I loved it. I still do. And it, that was what got me interested in behavioral science, because we had results and the yeah. results were often as I said, you know, it was a science of exceptions. Why the hell have twice as many people replied to this, even though the price is the same and the product's the same? What's going on? That was what got me interested in behavioral science. And one of the great things we used to say in direct marketing was, you know, that roughly speaking, there was a rule of three in communications, okay? There was creative, targeting, and other stuff, okay? Right? And Roughly speaking, actually, they were equally important because the effect was multiplicative. It wasn't additive, right? So if you had shit creative, obviously, you could perfectly target an envelope that said piss off and you wouldn't get any responses, okay? Other than people sending you dog shit back through the post, right? Right. So shit creative isn't going to get any responses. Shit targeting isn't going to get any responses. And if you get something else, and this is what I call behave, you know, I I used to call behavioral science before I knew what it was called, the thing for which we have no name. If you, for instance, you have two products and one of them is more expensive than the other, and you don't explain why the more expensive one is better, you won't sell either of them. That's just a, you know, what you might call a framing effect. Hmm. Okay. And uh, by the way, I've, I've, I've seen that happen a few times. I had a, 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 I, I think they've solved the problem. Nestle launched two Virtuo coffee machines. I don't know if you've got the Nespresso Virtuo, have you? Very fine thing. Something um, like that, yeah. I can highly recommend it. Um, yeah. I, I have, There's so many ways to make coffee. It's incredible. I'll, I'll, don't, <laughs> don't, don't ever get onto YouTube and watch a guy called James Hoffman, who's the world champion barista, because yeah. he will show you a 15-minute video on how to make V60 pour over coffee. Yeah. You'll, you'll start that video as a relatively sane man, and you'll end up importing your bloody filter papers from Japan and spending $2,000 on a grinder. Yeah, it's, it's an endless cavern. I, I've got, yeah. I, I sprung for one of the fancy, like, Gajia uh, coffee makers, but then, you know, you, it can keep going, you, and then all of a sudden you're soldering things, and then it's... Yeah, it's you, over. You, yeah. you got it exactly. Yeah, the, a gorgeous thing manufactured in the UK by a jet engine scientist called the okay. nine barista yeah um it's about 259 dollars or something but that's that's the kind of example of on the other hand of course it incre- it's what i call benign bullshit actually the bullshit we go through to prepare the coffee probably enhances our enjoyment of the coffee just as food you've cooked yourself tastes better than food that you know you've got out of a microwave it's right. not you know i mean I, we shouldn't totally discard these psychological effects because you know Medicine discards the placebo effect too much because it defines medicine as overall effect minus placebo equals real medicine. Yeah. Well, why don't you look at it as placebo times medicine equals overall effect and try and maximize both? You know, because right. I'm sure that the solution to weight loss will ultimately be a combination of something like metformin or <clears throat> one of these things combined with a behavioral regimen. You know. Right. And I think that's what's so cool about, you know, what, what you're doing at Ogilvy and, and the idea of grounding everything in direct mail and things that are test, testable is that people's frustration with the ad space isn't the creativity. It's the creativity with, you know, the lack of grounding and this idea of, the, of like a branding agency that has no way to quantify anything they ever do and that sort of thing. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that and, and maybe to 
adjust the question a bit. I think a lot of our audience are running, you know, boutique agencies. It seems like there's a big trend towards specialization where you have like small well, groups of people. Well, I was going to say, I was going to have things. my little rant yeah. here, which is that yeah. even though we've moved off, so, so even though we've moved off being paid by commission, yeah. the agency still has a muscle memory that behaves as though if we don't produce communication as a result of this engagement, we've somehow failed. And I worry about marketing in general has become too much identified with Marcoms. It's not all about communication. It's about the, the deployment of psychological insight and creativity to solve business problems in general, sometimes but not necessarily involving paid for or bought or earned or whatever it is, or rented uh, media. Okay. Right. But the use of media I mean, unless you take media at its very, very broad definition, is not necessary nor sufficient to the practice of creative marketing. And yet most agencies focus on this component of it to the exclusion of everything else. And part of the reason I founded a behavioral science practice is I like marketing, okay? I like marketing in general. I like package design. I like, uh, you know, ingenious pricing. I like ingenious framing. Uh, you know, I like solving problems through a combination of insight and ingenuity, you know, psychological triz, as I call it. Yeah. Okay. And one of the great things about behavioral science practice is finally, we can have these conversations which go, which cover the waterfront in marketing terms, and even go beyond the marketing department to a CEO or chief operating officer, because there's scope for creativity in HR, there's scope for creativity in, um, uh, in all manner of business pro problem solving. OK. Yeah. And yet we've confined ourselves. We've painted ourselves into this kind of can corner of, you know, perfect. I love it. Don't get me wrong. OK. Nothing makes me happier than to see Ogilvy produce a really, really good ad. But it's 20 percent of the waterfront. OK. It shouldn't be the be all and end all of what we do. Yeah. And, and with that and kind of getting towards the end of the time, I think that's a great way to kind of segue to Nudge Stock 2021. Which, which is on the 11th of June. And the 11th can be, of June. go to nudgestock.co.uk and you can register there. And I'll tell yeah, you a very interesting story it, about it. It describes it as a festival of BS. <laughs> now, as we all know, BS is an abbreviation for behavioral science. And it's also an abbreviation for bullshit. So I think you'll come across a headline that says 20,000 years of BS in 12 hours online. OK, and you'll come across, you know, uh, hear even more BS from the practitioners of, of, you know, behavioral science. Right now, that is a fantastic example of what the alchemist or the creative person does, which the other, which the run of the mill person doesn't do. And it's why creative people are a pain in the ass. And it's why they're often difficult to work with. And it's why they're necessary. And let me explain what it is. OK, I started this out with a conversation about what is called a conflict or a, a contradiction, that most problem solving is the need to solve some necessary ambiguity or conflict, okay? Now, what I notice is that this is absolutely classic. Well, BS is an abbreviation for, for bullshit, so we can't go there, is the standard reaction, okay? The creative person's reaction is to run towards the fire, not away from the fire. And so if you give them a contradiction or a problem, the typical person will run away from the contradiction and try and uh, try and escape it by ignoring the problem. The creative person, look at Guinness, right? Take bloody ages to pour. Good things come to those who wait. Stellar Artois is expensive, reassuringly expensive, okay? Avis isn't as big as Hertz. We're number two, so we try harder. That's what a creative person does. Now, I was at a training um, course uh, run in South Africa with Neil French, actually, uh, who was the worldwide creative director of Ogilvy at the time, or possibly of WPP. And we had to do a project for the South African Tourist Board. Now, bear in mind, this was in the early 2000s, OK, where the crime rate in South Africa was pretty goddamn through the roof. OK. And, you know, the briefing came to all the creative people, look, you're all going to mention this fact of crime, you know, of, of, of a crime problem. What we basically advise is don't go there. Just pretend it isn't happening. Go away, walk away. Okay. And there was a young copywriter there from Chicago, and I wish I could remember his name because he deserves a name check, because I've always remembered this. Okay. And we just said, look, just don't, don't go there. Don't mention the crime rate. Because if you mention it, if you try and reassure people, all you do is create a fear. Okay. This guy runs straight towards the fire and he discovers there's this luxury train, a bit like the Orient Express, which goes from, I can't remember, I think it's something like 
Cape Town to Pretoria or something, but through the Karoo Desert or whatever it is. And it's kind of super luxurious rail hotel, really. And he just writes an ad which shows this extraordinary interior, okay, of, of the rail hotel lux with, in all its luxury. And the headline simply reads, it's the carjacking capital of the world, so take the train. <laughs> okay, right. Now, uh, that, that's my tribe, okay? Immediately, both Neil French and I basically went, you're all right, you are, because you ignored the logical instruction and you ran towards the conflict or the contradiction. Right. Nearly everybody else in business develops some metrics or some targets, so we're coming back to the thing, which basically pretend that we must pursue this one metric under the pretense that nothing else is going on, okay? And it's a way of using data effectively to pretend there's no contradiction by selecting only pieces of data which you think you can safely optimize without measuring the hidden cost of the pursuit of that particular metric. Yep. That's called Goodhart's Law. Any metric that becomes a target loses its value as a metric. I'd go even further and say any metric that becomes a target almost certainly ends up sub-optimizing something that happens somewhere else. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And and with that, you know, the the lineup at Nudge Stock is stacked this year. You've got Daniel Kahneman himself, you have John Cleese, you have uh, Shazin Atari. Um one one aside is is I, I've always thought about John Cleese because I'm like Rory has to know John Cleese. Like, there has there's it's too close of a connection. I've never met him. You never uh, met my, him. My yeah. uh, a friend of mine um who tragically died a few weeks ago, you may know Tony Hendra, mm -hmm. who most famous as being the manager in Spinal, Spinal Tap, um, right. you know Boston, yeah. not 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 a college, not a big college town. Um, uh, he's the um, uh, he was friends with him, and um, I'm absolutely delighted to get him on. Not least because, and here's another plug. I've mentioned nudgedoc.co.uk and June the 11th as the date, which is the Friday. So you'll probably be working from home. Important point, we stream it over YouTube. I don't expect, okay, I don't expect you to sacrifice the use of your laptop. For a day so watch it on your tv if you've got a smart tv or chromecast it or something like that right and you know you know it's 12 hours so have it on in the background you know whatever treat it like you know talk radio of a highly uh, erudite form yeah um <coughs> but john cleese has also written a book on creativity very short you can read it in an afternoon which is a recommendation uh, it's a fantastic book yeah and he just makes the point that the creative process is fundamentally different it fundamentally involves people and temperaments and uh, approaches, which are often highly inimical to people of a very, very reductionist disposition. Yeah. But it's a great, great book. And um, I think it's called Creativity, A Short and Something Guide. Yeah, I have it on my bedside table, but I'm blanking on the exact name, but we'll, we'll get yeah, it linked up. I recommend it to everybody. Um, yeah. Also, what was what was the, the, didn't he make a series in the 80s of like business training videos and stuff? Yeah. I was trying to find so, those recently. <laughs> So he, they probably, I mean, they're probably still copyright protected, but he made a very successful business after he finished, um, I suppose it was after Faulty Towers, um, uh, where he um, uh, produced uh, extremely amusing and useful business training videos. Yeah. I think it was actually pretty lucrative. I've briefly forgotten what the company was called. Yeah, I'm sure. We were still I, I, watching them. Uh, you could, to be honest, you could probably bring them. They're back. like sales and client service training yeah. videos, which is such a bizarre thing for him to but do. It was, after very, very towers. it was brilliantly clever because yeah. what does humor do? Well, one, it makes the thing entertaining, so people actually want to watch it. Right. Okay. Secondly, humor allows you to say things that you can't say seriously. Right. Right. So it's one of the reasons why it's such a useful creative technique. You know. You could argue that, you know, people like Boris Johnson, our current premier, are allowed to overuse it to a degree. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's a it's a very, very useful thing that you can communicate things humorously that you can't say seriously. You could argue, and Nassim always argues that it's a way of signaling intelligence without nerdiness, but it's also a way of actually saying things which, if you said them straight, would cause a counter reaction. Yeah, right. And so this is an interesting debate, by the way, about the woke movement, which is the woke movement is entirely well intentioned. OK, I don't dis I don't I don't miss I don't disalign myself from any of its objectives. Yeah. But as a communications and persuasion um, specialist, 
I have to raise questions when I think it's actually being counterproductive or ineffective, which in some cases it is. Now, people like Stephen Fry, for example, believe that the slightly tone deaf left is actually creating the extreme right. I think that it's definitely catalyzing it in some way. <laughs> by the way, seems I mean, undeniable. By, by yeah. the way, one of the things you've discovered in moving to Austin, I'm I'm totally guessing here, yeah. is that actually in smaller communities, the right and the left coexist pretty happily. Well, it's funny because I actually, and this isn't unique to Austin. My mom's from from the South, and I think the liberal enclaves in the South are actually more left. You know, they're more they're, they kind of circle the wagons more. Uh, so, I, I've, if anything, I've seen more more of that here than even in New York. You know, <laughs> where I where I'm coming from. So, but it's, it's interesting, kind of interesting if you the the um one of the things I noticed, which was when I moved out of London, which always struck me as just fascinating, is that I went to a sort of country fair in Kent. Yeah. And there were three stalls side by side. One of them was the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, so a wildlife charity. The next one sold joysticks and kind of patchouli oil and stuff. Yeah. And the third one sold shotgun cartridges, right? <laughs> and I burst out laughing as a recently ev- you know, evacuated Londoner, going, what idiot put those three businesses together? Right. And then I went, went a bit closer and discovered they were all actually chatting to each other and making each other cups of tea. Yeah. And so you realize that actually uh, high population density and high levels of homophily weirdly create the problem you'd think they'd solve. Yeah. Which is that, I mean, I was talking to someone in Bozeman, Montana, and he said that in Bozeman, Montana, you have the strange thing, which is the um, the local co-op is run by essentially um, a, a group of uh, a, a, of trans hippies. Okay. Yeah. And the customer base is 50% guys who drive in in pickup trucks, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oddly, he said, they actually commune and coexist perfectly happily uh, in a way that he hadn't expected. Well, and that's that's something I've always noticed kind of going back and forth from like the rural south to, to places like New York is that there's actually more – there's issues, but there's there seems to be more integration. And I might be wrong about this, but I think the stats kind of bear that out. You know, there's more there's more uh, integrated marriages and that sort of thing on the rise in, in the south. In the south, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which yeah, yeah Houston, which is, Houston, which is a city I love, which I think is the most diverse city in the United States. What city was that again? I missed it. Houston. And yeah, it, you know, I, I I love it. I've said, you know, it seems, you know, now okay, I'm a white guy, right? I'm a middle aged white British guy, so I'm not really posing an existential threat to any of these groups, I guess. Right. But nonetheless, I've always found it. I've, I've always found it impressively interesting. You know that. Um, it's a big city. Yeah, I still need. To, I still haven't spent much time there. But I, uh, it, 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 I, I suspect it's a better place to live than it is to visit. But I've always found. I've always warmed to it. Extra. I mean, this is the, by the way, the funny thing about politics when you think about it, okay, yeah. is that you have these huge feuds, right? Mm-hmm. And you ask people, okay, on the left, where would you like to live? And they say, they might say Denmark or Canada, okay, yeah. or Sweden, okay? And you ask people more to the right, you know, people in the middling right might say Australia, which is pro- probably a bit more right wing than the UK in some right. respects, okay? And then people on the further right might say, you know, Texas or somewhere. Yeah. But actually, those places, I could live in all of them perfectly happily. To be honest, yeah. if I lived in Scandinavia, I'd probably become a bit more right wing. And if I lived in Texas, I'd probably go on about why you need socialized medicine. OK, right. so as a kind of yeah. countercultural thing. Nevertheless, there, you know, they are all places where you could carve out an acceptable existence. I yeah, think. I've always I've always felt the same way. And I went to college in UC Santa Cruz and I was way <laughs> more right than I am you know, now uh, living in New York, well, <laughs> or rather I'm way more right. I was way more right then and then continuing through New York. But then I, when I was growing up in the Northern Virginia, DC suburbs, which was pretty yeah. conservative, I was, you know, super left, like <laughs> wearing Che Guevara shirts when, it, when I was in high school. This so. is Jonathan Haidt's point that the right doesn't really exist as a coherent yeah. movement. It exists or it creates itself in response to the perceived excesses of the left. Yeah. It, and it's I've always thought it's an interesting way of yeah. looking at it. Yeah. Well, I've always thought that it's sort of like uh, you get what you want, just not when you want it kind of thing, where it's like, wow, the world kind of conformed to what I wish it was when I was a 16 year old in high school and, you know, being a rebellious kid in suburban Virginia. It's just like, yeah, I, it just I happened bet. way, the timeline I know, I know was way suburban off. suburban Virginia, but... <laughs> and I can tell you, if I'd grown up in suburban Virginia, I think yeah. I would have gone the other way as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So it's at the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> you want a street named after contrarian. a tree by any chance? 
Uh, I was on a street called Trotting Horse, actually. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, w- w- way sillier than that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, lovely. But, you know, I mean, you know, a hell of a lot of this stuff is actually reactive. Yeah. And so, you know, my argument is that there are well intentioned movements that are nonetheless actually ineffectual or counterproductive. Right. Right. And then they, they have to find the, the right way to communicate, basically. Well, if, if you derive pleasure from annoying people you don't like, I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. I'm simply saying that in 30 years of advertising work, I've never seen anybody think that's a good idea. I know we'll do some Ford advertising, which insults the users of General Motors vehicles, has right. never been, because those people are your future converts at some right. point. Yeah, and that and that's why you know there's there's a lot of people that postulate that it's kind of kind of death culty <laughs> in, so, in certain certain aspects, but we'll see what they do and we'll see what how, how they how they emerge from it. But uh, with with that, Roy, I want to be respectful of your time and everything. And uh, Nudge Stock is is going to be huge this year, but we're really excited to join. So Friday, June eleventh, we'll get that all linked up. Uh, Roy, let's do this again. I think we could talk for. We'll do it again. I'll be absolutely delighted. Any old time. Fantastic. Yeah, Have a thanks, great man. Time. Appreciate it. Are you going back to New York afterwards, or are you taking the advantage of flexible working to it? So- so uh, it's it's kind of weird because I've I've uh, you know had an online business since twenty fifteen or so so it's it's sort of uh, yeah I I think we will go back to New York but it's kind of a moving target we're just test driving cities right now. What, so. what New York actually needs is pod housing, isn't it? Like tiny because yeah. there's no point in having a large apartment in New York because the interest is all out of doors, right? I can watch Netflix anywhere, right? right. Yeah. So I've always wondered whether what London actually needs, it's very difficult for the market to produce it because the market's dominated actually by buy-to-let investors. Uh, uh, the, 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 the new property market is dominated by buy-to-let investors and overseas investors in London who are obsessed with, of course, two-bedroom apartments, which are useless for families, but brilliant for renting to, to two salaried individuals, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And actually what London really needs is tiny, tiny pod homes, where right. literally you can go and crash and you can do your Londony, New Yorky kind of things and go outside and then keep all your shit in Austin, you know, where there's a bit of space. Well, exactly. And I just keep thinking of the George Carlin did about stuff where he's just like, it's your, your own stuff is stuff. Other people's stuff is shit, you know? Yes. <laughs> and yeah, it's yeah. Just, yeah. he's just talking about having stuff yeah. all over the country. And that's kind of what my situation, I have stuff in New York, I have stuff in Austin, you know? So, but a bit yeah, of property that, arbitrage, a bit of real estate that's, arbitrage. That sounds very Japanese. It sounds like something they would they would figure out first. It's some, some Zen solution to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's you'll, you'll have to run with that. So Rory, thanks again, man. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks ever so much. Yeah, take care.